Welcome back to Biomechanics Lab. In this lecture, we're going to go over the structure and function of the hip joint. All right, here's a picture of the pelvis. And we're looking at the anterior side of the pelvis, and that makes this leg over here the person's right leg. If we start at the top of the pelvis, we have the ilium right here, and it's on both sides. Notice the pelvis is symmetric. It has two hemispheres, a left and a right hemisphere. Here's left, here's right. We see the ilium is at the top. Um, this small engorgement that kind of goes around the top of the ilium is called the iliac crest. We go inferior to that, we have the ischium down here. And then the most medial part is going to be the pubis. Okay, And hopefully we can see that the pubis is going to be connected, each pubis on each hemisphere, by the symphysis pubis, or sometimes referred to as the pubic symphysis. And this was one of our ampiarthroses, which was a slightly or only partially movable joint. Not totally movable and not totally immovable. It's right there in the middle. Okay. Now on either side of the pelvis, left and right, we have this kind of hole. And this hole, or this kind of invagination, is called the acetabulum. Now, the hip joint is a true ball and socket joint. And ball and socket joints are joints that allow movement in all planes of motion. So we have motion in sagittal plane, the frontal plane, and the transverse plane. And one of the reasons that we're able to have that is because the femur, the head of the femur is just this ball. Okay, you can't really see it there. Whoops. Okay, but this hole is the socket. And so the ball, which is on the femoral head, just fits into the acetabulum, the socket. And so it's sort of like the ball just rotates around the socket and you can get free motion of the leg, or at least in case, this case the bone, the femur, you can get free rotation in all three planes of motion. Okay. Now, while not technically part of the hip, we do have on the right leg the uh, proximal bone, this is the femur. Um, we see that the femur is going to connect down here to the tibia, and then here's the lateral bone, the fibula. Okay, We'll talk more about these bones, including the patella right here, the knee bone, when we talk about the knee joint. Okay, All right, so in both these cases, flexion and extension, we're starting out with our legs right beside each other. Now, some of these are kind of hard to put into words, um, so let me explain it like this. Flexion of the hip, that is. Now notice, although this person's knee is bent, we are not talking about the knee joint. Okay, this joint right here, we're not talking about that. We are only talking about the hip joint. We can have flexion of the knee. We can. But we're only talking about flexion of the hip. Okay? Now, basically, one way that you can view flexion of the hip are two things that that are, that are caused by flexion of the hip. Imagine if you tried to basically knee someone right in front of you. So if you tried to knee someone right in front of you, a knee strike, you would have to lift your, your leg up like this. Okay. Now this is one way to do it. Another way you can think about it is if you just tried to kick a person in front of you. Now when you knee the person, your knee is bent like this. Okay. That doesn't matter. We don't care about the angle of the knee. But if you kick someone, your leg is probably fully, or your knee is probably fully extended. But either way, your leg has to come up in front of you, and the movement is occurring in the sagittal plane. Okay, so hopefully that description kind of helps you understand what flexion is. Um, a good quiz question would be something like if you attempted to strike somebody in front of you with your knee, or if you tried to kick someone in front of you, what specific motion of the hip joint are you doing? If we look over here, uh, these are examples of extension. So generally with extension, what we're doing is we're trying to basically, if we start out with our leg, um, basically um, in a straight line with the rest of our body, meaning our leg is basically parallel to our torso like this, we're basically just trying to put our leg or, and foot behind our body. We're trying to rotate our foot such that it's posterior to our body. So for example, if he starts out like this, then basically his leg or foot comes behind his body as shown right here. Okay. So whereas with flexion, you're sort of in the sagittal plane bringing your knee in front of your body or your leg in front of your body, depending on how you're looking at it, with hip extension, you're bringing your leg behind your body. Okay. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. 
abduction, adduction, these occur in the frontal plane, whereas flexion and extension are going to occur in the sagittal. So for abduction and adduction, the definitions are still pretty much the same. Abduction on the left with a B, abduction is bringing your leg away from the midline of your body. So you can see this person is moving their leg. They're basically rotating their leg using their hip joint. So their leg moves away from their body. Okay. Adduction is basically bringing it back. And you can even move it uh, basically towards the other direction. Now notice one thing that's really important is when you're talking about abduction versus adduction, notice that generally speaking for most people you can abduct a greater degree, so 45 degrees, more than you can adduct. Okay, this you can only do it about 20 degrees. Okay, now it's going to vary on a person's flexibility, but generally speaking, the, in terms of the hip joint, there's more capacity to abduct than there is adduct. Likewise, when we talk about flexion versus extension, there is more of an ability to flex the hip. In other words, bring the leg in front of you, then there is bring it bringing it behind you. And I think if you try this, and we'll do this in class, um, you'll be able to see that pretty easily. Okay, I think it's fairly intuitive. Here's a look at the, some of the same movements, but from a different point of view. Here's flexion and extension. These both occur in the sagittal plane. In flexion, again, we don't care if the knee is flexed or extended. Um, the point is with flexion, this person is bringing their right leg in front of them in the sagittal plane. Um, so what they're doing is they're performing a flexion of their right hip. Okay, Extension is basically just moving that leg behind you. So basically behind um, your posterior side. Okay, And you can see here this is the person's right leg and so that means their right hip is in extension. Okay. We're talking about abduction and adduction. Um, that's occurring in the frontal plane. Abduction with a B right here is basically having the same definition as before with the shoulder. Abduction is moving your limb away from the midline of your body. So if this is the midline, abduction, this person is moving their right leg away. And that is right hip abduction. If they did this leg over here, that would be left leg abduction. Adduction with a D, you're basically moving the leg back and you can actually overshoot the midline as long as you're bringing it in this direction. So this person's right hip is in adduction. Okay. Now, we can also externally and internally rotate the hip. The best way to think about this is if you have whatever leg you're talking about fully extended, okay, and really what I mean is your knee is fully extended, so you're basically kind of standing up, and if you basically take your, let's say your right leg in this case, and rotate it such that your foot basically points away from your midline. So see how this person's midline is right here, and they've rotated their right foot so that it's pointed out, okay, away from their midline. That process of starting an anatomical position and moving the foot, rotating the leg such that the foot points out, that is external rotation. It's called external rotation because basically your foot is rotating outward. It's pointing externally now, okay? Whereas for internal rotation, your foot's moving from anatomical position in the opposite direction. You're basically pointing your foot towards your midline, okay? Now, there's a few other kinds of um, motions that we have, and basically when we say diagonal abduction, and diagonal adduction. We're basically combining abduction and adduction with basically a movement either back or forward. Okay, so for example, with diagonal addu abduction, with a B, this person is moving their right leg away from their midline, but they're also moving their right leg backwards. So one way you could sort of think about diagonal abduction is they're abducting, but they're also extending their hip at the same time. For diagonal adduction, what they're doing, basically the way to think about it, is they're flexing their hip because their leg is coming in front of their body, but they're also adducting their hip because their leg is moving toward the midline. Okay, So these are kind of combinations of movements. That's one way to kind of think about those. Okay. 
Now, here's some of the major muscles that we have. Um, we'll come back and look at these in more detail on one of the tables in a few minutes. This is the anterior view, and then B over here on the right is the posterior view. Now, one thing that's kind of, I'm going to kind of allude to this because we're going to cover this more next week whenever we talk about the knee joint. When we talk about the knee joint, there are two really important um, groups of muscles. One of them we typically refer to as the quadricep muscles. Those are going to promote extension of the knee joint. And then we have the knee flexors, which are the hamstring muscles. Okay? When somebody says, oh, I'm going to work out my hamstrings, or I'm going to work out my quads, there's actually, for both of those groups, multiple muscles within the group. Okay? If I'm looking at the anterior view, let's see if we can find the quadricep muscles. So here's the way to learn the quadricep muscles. You memorize that the quadricep muscles have the rectus femoris, and then you just find the three vastus muscles. There's three vastus muscles and the rectus femoris. Vastus lateralis, intermedius, and medialis. Those are your quadricep muscles, okay? Generally, they're going to promote extension of the knee. What we're going to find from the perspective of the hip is that, in general, the quads really don't play much of a role with the hip joint. They're pretty much only the knee joint. There's one exception which we'll mention in a few minutes. But the hamstring muscles play much more of a role in the hip joint. So the hamstring muscles, which are going to be shown over here, are going to play a role in the hip joint and the knee joint. So the hamstring muscles are basically, let's see if we can find it, um, the bicep femoris. Now notice this is not the rectus femoris. Rectus femoris is quads. Bicep femoris is a hamstring muscle, and then we have two others, semitendinosus and semimembranosus. So bicep femoris and two semis are the hamstring muscles. Those are going to play more of a role in both the knee joint and the hip joint. And we'll look at a table that kind of shows that in a few minutes. Um, you're welcome to look these pictures in your book or in the PowerPoint lecture here. Um, we're not going to spend too much time on where the muscles are uh, looking at these because there's more important things. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of look at the agonist muscles of the hip joint. And as we'll go through here, you'll see that there really aren't any um, quadricep muscles. There's one. It's actually on this slide. And that's because it's the only one of the four quadricep muscles that plays a role in the hip. All right. So what we're going to do, first of all, is we're going to talk about flexion versus extension of the hip. So we're looking for anything that moves in the sagittal. Okay. Luckily, this... Uh, this uh, PowerPoint slide, these four slides that I'm going to have, or five really, they're very organized. So first of all, flexion of the hip. Let's look at things that promote hip flexion. Remember what flexion was? That's this motion right here. All right. So first of all, the iliacus, flexion of the hip. We have another muscle, it's a very long muscle, called the psoas. Um, some people actually, there's actually a fuller name of it called the iliopsoas. Okay. Um, those are going to promote hip flexion. The rectus femoris, the reason, this is the only quad muscle that's going to be involved in hip movement, but the rectus femoris does promote some hip flexion. Now, notice, it's extension of the knee, but for the hip, it's flexion. Sartorius is going to promote hip flexion. We're not going to concern ourselves with the knee here. Pectineus, hip flexion. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Now let's skip over to where we have hip extension. All right, so I skipped one slide. We're going to go from flexion to extension. All right, now notice for extension of the hip, we start with semitendinosus. Now remember, that was a hamstring muscle, so it's going to promote knee flexion, but the semitendinosus in the case of the hip promotes hip extension. Semimembranosus, hip extension. Bicep femoris, hip extension. The gluteus maximus, which is on your rear, that is hip extension. Okay. Now let's go back and look at abduction versus adduction. Now remember, I kind of skipped over this a little bit. This is our extension, but remember, abduction is moving your leg away from the midline in the frontal plane, and adduction is moving it towards the midline and even a little further in the frontal plane. Let's see if we can find those. Now, the sartorius does promote some abduction of the hip, but in general, the sartorius is very weak in terms of that. We're going to go and look at some of the stronger ones here. Okay, so we start here. The gluteus medius, hip abduction. Gluteus minimus, hip abduction. 
the tensor fascia lata, hip abduction. Okay, and then these are all going to be transverse movements, which we'll cover last. Okay, so hopefully that gives you some idea which ones are going to be abduction. Now let's look for the ones that are adduction. So let's now go to ones that are strongly adducting. Pectineus is strongly adducting the hip. Okay, adductor brevis, that should kind of give that away in the name. That's a hip adductor. Adductor longus, along with adductor magnus. Those are all going to be involved in adduction of the hip. The gracilis is also adduction of the hip. Okay, so hopefully that gives you some idea, and you can go through these these tables in your in this PowerPoint presentation, or they're in your textbook, and they'll give you an idea of which muscles are involved in what. So one of the things is, and um, while this isn't on the activity that you're going to have to do, you should think about. If you go do various exercises in the gym, for example, there in the in the UT Tyler gym, there's actually in the leg section on the machines, there's actually an abductor machine and an adductor machine. You should think about which muscles you're actually working more of if you're doing, say, the adductor. Well, if you're doing the adductor, you're going to be working the pectineus, the adductor brevis longus and magnus, and the gracilis, right? If you're worried about abduction, so that's going to be on the abductor machine, you're going to be worried about the gluteus medius, the gluteus minimus, and the tensor fasciae latae. Okay? Now the last slide here is talking a lot about external rotation. There's a lot of muscles that are actually going to be promoting external rotation. Notice all of these are. Um, if we go back and look at what external rotation is, that's this muscle right, or that's this movement, excuse me, right here. So if we go back, we can see a bunch of muscles that are actually promoting that. Some of these you may not have heard of. Um, some of these are not actually covered in anatomy and physiology lab, but it's worth mentioning. The piriformis, gemellus superior, gemellus inferior, obturator internus, obturator externus, and the quadratus femoris. Notice, this is not quadricep femoris, this is the quadratus femoris. Okay. Um, these are all in the transverse plane because they're rotation. And these are all hip external rotation. Again, pectineus is actually more external hip rotation. We also see that um, adductor brevis also does external rotation. So most of these are actually going to be in external rotation. We can see the gracilis actually has some hip internal rotation, but it's not as strong. Okay? Semitendinosis is going to be internal rotation. Semimembranosis, internal rotation. Okay. What we can say is that these two hamstring muscles are going to promote the internal rotation of the hip. Okay. And in terms of the gluteus me medius, we see that the anterior fibers of this muscle promote internal rotation, while the posterior fibers promote external hip rotation. But the gluteus minimus promotes internal rotation. Okay. So depending on the question, they may ask you for an exercise that maybe promotes hip flexion. You need to be able to look at this table and discern which muscle is going to be promoting hip flexion. Or if they ask extension, abduction, adduction, and so on and so forth. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully this gives you a little intuition on the hip joint and the muscles of the hip joint. Um, next week we're going to cover more of the knee joint uh, specifically, and we're going to see the particularly the hamstring muscles, and then we're also going to talk more about the quadricep muscles for that. See you next week.